Добрый день, уважаемые коллеги. Very good morning, dear colleagues. With your permission, we'll start the seminar. Many of you may know that the HSC, for a decade at least, has been doing lots of research on innovative policies, in particular on supporting STIs and on cluster development and industrial policies. And we have been holding expert panels and workshops on most relevant aspects of innovation and cluster policies over the past year. We partook in a number of pioneer research projects and we will tell you more about that today. And all those studies and surveys were related to the key initiatives of the federal government and regional governments of our country. Seeking new areas of growth and uh, trying to grope for tools to support economic growth and uh, social development and step up innovations in different sectors of our economy. So today we want to dwell on two main points. Most importantly, on the perception of the federal agenda on regional and cluster development in the past over the past years, like recapping those policies and uh, in the past couple of years, alongside the well tested tools and formulae related to support of innovative territorial and industrial clusters, we've, we've seen the emergence of new initiatives. To implement the national goals of, as per the May decree of President Putin in, of 2018 and the national projects that followed over the past couple of years. New formats came to the fore, including innovate, innovative technology centers that used to be called technology valleys in the past, and the educational centers of the science projects and the leading research centers of the global uh, of the national digital economy program. So, lots of new institutional tools and forms have emerged. They may partly overlap and be mutually complementary, but at the same time we see that we should have an overview of how these forms have been emerging, how they have been developing and what their prospects for near future may be. Besides, regions may jump ahead of the federal agenda, coming up with new ideas and projects of their own to support cooperation between academia and universities in the real sector of the economy to um, bolster growth areas. Every now and then they do that irrespective of the federal formats. So anyway, anyway th there is a need for feedback to be able to percept all the, perceive all these initiatives and identify the best practices and be able to come up with guidelines to raise the efficiency of the regional project. So this is the focus of the Russian Cluster Observatory of the HSC, being a well-recognized analytics research center, a think tank in STI and, and cluster policies. So this seminar today would go as follows. Some of the procedural matters. So we'll focus on the latest outcomes of the innovative and cluster policies on regional and national levels in this country. We want to come up with uh, the global uh, uh, perspective and we have a special guest here today, the keynote speaker, who will tell us about the best international practices, the current practices, latest ones, and we want to dwell upon the key 
major projects implemented in Moscow and other regions. I would first like to yield to my colleague, Mr. Bronitsky, Director of the Strategy Department of the Education and, and uh, Science Ministry. So it's quite a relevant speaker for our workshop because now, currently, the State Council is meeting, presided by President Putin, and expert community was got prepared for this meeting for a whole year. One of the items on the agenda of the State Council meeting is to relegate some of the powers towards the regional level in STI policies. It is quite relevant, I mean this devolution, because it's a vast country with lots of environments and uh, sets of conditions. So over the past 10 to 15 years, this agenda was put on the back burner and uh, we lost some time and some opportunities and it is important to come back to that once again. So a number of the aspects on that meeting's agenda I think are relevant for us. We worked on that for several months, so over to you, Mr. Bronitsky. Thank you, Mr. Vice-Rector. Dear colleagues, good afternoon. Indeed, this week is quite important to be able to grasp and understand how the STI agenda will look in future from the perspective in particular of the original STI policies. And uh, we have worked hard to shape and uh, apprehend how it all looks now. Well, the State Council's uh, task force headed under, he headed by Mr. Travnikov toiled a lot and the executive office of the president and the federal government together with the expert community did a lot. So in the past three days from the 4th of February and up to today the joint meeting of the State Council and the Council on Science Education under the President of the Russian Federation is due to start in several minutes to provide answers on how STI policies of the Russian Federation will be unfolding in future from the original and spatial development perspective in particular. When we prepared all the material and for the a council meeting, state council meeting. We got some feedback, we took some feedback from the governors of regions and they had asked how the equilibrium between the powers and the competence of the regions and STI and their responsibility for the outcomes and uh, the availability or lack of resources looks currently. And we see that there is demand from the regions to receive, to be given, to be vested with more powers, to receive more competences. And we see at the same time, and that should be backed by the by, but at the same time we see that there is lack of eagerness to be accountable for the outcomes of the economic development of the regions. We had an in-depth analysis exercise to analyze the strategies of social socio-economic development of our regions, and most of them have approved these strategies. And there was a draft decree that turned to be a decree in 2016, and it spelled out that the original strategies must be brought in line with the federal socio-economic development strategy. Many of the regions did just a tick box exercise, a formal exercise. They have some of the quotes in the text, but with respect to real KPIs and indicators are present only in 36 strategies out of the 
80 something regions. So, anyway, the goal to step up and speed up R&D is contained in only 27 regional strategies. So, we are to work hard to pinpoint the specific measures for regions to implement and deliver the policies, the federal policies, including the STI policies. And our ministry, Science and Education Ministry, is ready to work with you in concert. We have a, an extensive toolkit, Economic Development Ministry and the Science and Education Ministry in concert have been working to create the national technology centers. We will also have other formats, but we must have this wheel spinning. And it is our joint work. It should be our joint work. We are to increase the regional gross domestic products to accelerate the economic advancement of all the regions. So I call on you to be able to view all these issues and uh, review them and uh, think how you will work in the future. Have a good workshop. All the best to you. Thank you, Mr. Bronitsky. I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Hatsenka. Director of the Regional and Industrial Department of the Trade and uh, Industry Ministry. Trade and Industry Ministry has been implementing a program to support regional technology parks, industrial parks, and uh, technology clusters. This is a successful program against other tools of federal and regional policies. So the perspective of them of that ministry is important for us industry and uh, trade ministry is important for us so will you tell us of the novel things and measures of your ministry thank you mr goldberg comrades in arms good afternoon we are like minded in promoting the cluster policies our ministry trade and industry ministry has been doing a lot to establish industrial clusters on, on Russian soil, as spelled out in Federal Law 488 on industrial policies. So this institution is to be established, well established in our economy. There are more than 45 clusters currently in more than 30 constituent entities. So, two constituent entities of the Russian Federation in the past could have patronage under one and the same cluster, but now, like uh, the Republic of Buryatia, can, is not limited or confined by the geographic proximity and the neighbors. They can choose a region which is far from their regional borders and they may set up clusters with them like a spray products manufacturing or instrument manufacturing clusters are the recent examples or the production of synthetic sapphire accounting for 98% of the Russian domestic production and the a chunk of the international market of the sapphires that are used for LED and smartphone screens. So we are so lucky to have this requirement on the neighboring uh, regions repealed as different regions all up and down the country can now cooperate. So industrial clusters are manufacturing sites that necessarily must turn out products that is a value chain 
that is to be linked and closed. And uh, the, the CEOs of in industrial enterprises are vested with more responsibility they had to make their own decisions to set up industrial sites and localize components production. We received one ruble from the federal budget by the ministry, totally around 3 billion rubles. Couple it with extra budgetary resources, so the relationship is one federal ruble to seven extra budgetary rubles of investments, private investments. And the revenue soars as a result of that. We see greater share of the investments, and the president had set forth a target to have the investments at 25% of the gross regional products by 2025. So, what is to happen to Decree 41, Federal Decree Number 41? You may think we work actively on that and. Uh, now we have the new makeup of the government, and uh, our patron has changed. And the previous makeup of the government had uh, one perspective on clusters, and now the, the focus has shifted with a new cabinet sworn in. And uh, in his recent State of the Nation address, President Putin has said that the national projects are not only industrial ones or sectoral ones, like the oncology centers, equipment and uh, creation of new facilities. It is also, there is also a goal to provide orders to the industrial sites and clusters of the Russian Federation so that they are reoriented to the national project's needs. they should produce the final products or the components. And third strategy pillar is like the contribution of the defense industrial sector to the cluster policies development. And uh, the defense industry should receive the support to re-equip and buy new machinery to produce state-of-the-art items. Like 2020, by 2024, 25 trillion rubles will be earmarked. Out of these, out of this amount of 25 trillion rubles, 6.2 trillion is uh, the funds that will be used to re-equip the plants and 3.2 trillion is, is, should be the contribution of the industry. So we need many more new items, high quality items manufactured in our facilities and our industrial sites. We hope for the new rounds of bidding and selection to deliver upon the goals. On the other hand, we will receive guaranteed demand. This is the money to be spent on national projects. So with this we'll close the circuit. And uh, so the our ministry plans to act in this vein to reshape industrial clusters and implement decree number 41. As regards the roster, it's worth mentioning. Well, what is the definition of the industrial clusters? There is definition in federal law 488. But it, it is specified in the guidelines and the requirements towards the federal law and the f government decree 779 spells out requirements to industrial clusters in the Russian Federation 
At the outset, I have said that we have lifted the geographic neighborhood or adjacency uh, requirement, which is a good thing. But, well, in a nutshell, it brings me to the end of my remarks. Thank you for the invitation to participate, to attend. It is important to have more these workshops in future so that the industrial clusters are in the spotlight, remain in the spotlight, and apart from the existing measures of backing, we'll do our utmost to integrate industrial clusters in other policies and measures, like the refund of direct spending is one of the measures to support And your expert opinion would be matter, would be important, would matter. So, lots of youths in this room. Your standpoint is of interest. We have relevant conferences and fora, like the Industrial Russia Forum and Technology Parks <coughs> conferences. Please do attend and participate and uh, speak up. We need your vision on how to revive and reinvigorate the industrial clusters to be able to have domestic manufacturing of uh, components and uh, spare parts and finished products. Thank you, Vitali. I think it is important that the Trade and Industry Ministry ha is now at the new stage of uh, measures of designing measures to support industrial clusters. They want to dismantle and minimize barriers. And I think that together with the colleagues from the ministry will have discussions and probably some an expert panel will hold an expert panel on the industrial clusters experience that we've had up to date and will speak about the governmental support measures and tools in different regions and different sectors. At the outset, I told you that we want to look at the model clusters and one of the most powerful in scope and uh, in scale and in sophistication is the toolkit of the Moscow Innovation Cluster. Last year, they were unfolded successfully, and now it has thousands of residents, including manufacturing and enterprises, education establishments and servicing companies, and academic and research. Uh, entities. So, Madam Vokhanitska, first deputy head of Department of Entrepreneurship and Innovative Development of the Government of Moscow, would tell us more about the agenda of the Moscow Innovative Cluster. We will tell you more in the course of the day about about the groundwork that they have and that may that, that may come in handy for other regions. Over to you, Madam. Mr. Goldberg. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Thank you for the invitation to participate and speak at this conference, at this seminar, workshop on cluster policies. The High School of Economics, since day one, together with Moscow Innovative Cluster Project, has been working hard, and we appreciate the expertise of yours and uh, your reviewing all, all our ideas. Thank you for that. Thank you for all your ideas, novel ideas. Cluster policies are relevant for the government of Moscow and the city of Moscow. The mayor instructed us in April 2018 to start working on that project in November 2018. It was supported by the president. And in the course of 2018, 2019, our team did a lot. We have come up with the regulatory acts and we had the, the first pilot on IT launched and the first backing measures came to the fore. Why do we need this cluster? Now we see that Moscow has huge potential in HR uh, research, industrial development, 
and manpower, and we know that there are some issues and problems in cooperation and collaboration between these all these stakeholders. So we decided to come up with a brand new tool to support cooperation between different participants. Why is it so different? Before 2019, the industrial policies and innovative policies aimed at three segments, industrial, enterprises, academia, and IT. But the mayor decided that we should lift all constraints and limitations on the economic activity type because all the innovative projects innovative projects may be in creative industries and trade and many other sectors so my colleagues and I are currently shaping the main areas of the cluster work streams and we're designing support measures we are co-founding engineering costs and industrial design costs of up to 50% no more than 50 million per per enterprise we do our best to uh, modernize and upgrade enterprises and their machinery on the 28th of December a decree of the government of Moscow on the support of innovative uh, pro projects was enacted and in the middle of the quarter we will open a call to support major large-scale innovative projects and the IT platform of our cluster is of special importance for us because the online infrastructure is what we need to be developing at an o over stripping pace we need to grow s s seek for partners and uh, pilot novel solutions together with them we are quite ambitious and bold in terms of fostering cooperation and collaboration my counterpart will tell you more about the technical tools and how it all works and in, in a nutshell by cl in closing i want to tell you that now we have 750 companies registered as participants so i call on you to to watch us to keep an eye on us and be not side observers but participate we are open there are no constraints no limitations we would appreciate your support and your input and your contribution when lies the cluster structure there are 30 percent of academic entities there which is more than the share the stake of the industrial enterprises so please participate i dot moscow is the cluster platform you can learn everything about the measures and the structure and, and apply online thank you thank you so much christina dear colleagues Today we have invited our colleague, Professor Christian Kettles, who is one of the most renowned global cluster policies experts. And Christian has received a PhD in the London School of Economics, which is a long-standing partner of ours. They worked hard for many years with us and Christian has been with Harvard Business School working with uh, Michael Porter who needs doesn't need an an introduction Christian was president of TCI network and now he's president of advisory board of the TCI network and it was agreed by us that Christian today will tell you some words about the key the core tenets in uh, competitiveness development and uh, how to support and back and shape clusters. At the end of the workshop, we'll have a Q&A session, so please just listen to the speaker, the keynote speaker and other speakers, and later ask your questions during the Q&A. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Gokberg. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here at the High School of Economics. We had a long-standing relationship uh, with the Russian Cluster Observatory, so it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, with you. 
Uh, it clearly is the right time to uh, be here. Uh, and I really appreciate the comments, both from the two gentlemen from the ministry and uh, uh, from the uh, uh, Moscow city. Um, you've worked with clusters for a couple of years. As is quite usual in many places, some things worked, other things did not work so well. Um, and it's a good time to really step back and try to see, you know, what are the lessons that we've learned? What do we need to change? But also, what are the elements that we can keep so that we really explore the opportunities further that clusters provide to us? What I want to do first is uh, to take you away from Moscow um, and take you to a place where I spent quite a lot of my time, uh, which is Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about this case because uh, it is both a sign of the promise of clusters, uh, you know, certainly. Uh, especially in life sciences, this is one of the places in the world that a lot of others try to emulate and try to follow. But I also wanted to talk a little bit about the story because it helps to dispel some of the myth around clusters. Both of the myth that you can totally create something out of nothing, but also the opposite myth that clusters are not something where governments or government policies really have any role. Now, if you look at this particular case of Cambridge, Massachusetts and life sciences, I think what you hear often is, well, you know, it's pretty easy to create a successful life sciences cluster in this city. You know, if you have two of the world leading universities, MIT and Harvard, the only thing you need to do is just wait a while and a successful cluster will emerge. The reality is actually quite different. I would like to take you back to 12th of September, 2003. So that day, we organized a conference at Harvard Business School with the president of Harvard at the time, Larry Summers, uh, the president of MIT, uh, Charles West, uh, and the governor of Massachusetts, uh, who is now a senator from Utah, um, to talk about how we could create more value out of the scientific capabilities that existed uh, in Boston. Because the reality at that time was there, wasn't, there was excellent research, there were excellent teaching hospitals, MGH and others, and Dana-Faber and so on. But there wasn't that much economic activity in biopharmaceuticals. There was one global pharmaceutical company that was in Boston, and it was Novartis. And the reason that we're there is because the guy that they wanted to hire to lead their global R&D headquarter wanted, did not want to move to Basel. He said, I want to stay in Boston. You know, there's an environment that I like. I want to be here. So they set up the center there. What started in 2003 was a process to say, you know, we need to work together. The regional government, the academic institutions, and the existing businesses in this field to figure out what we need to do in order to change this and really create an environment where a lot of startups can be there that will attract the global pharmaceutical companies that are looking for these two, uh, two uh, types of ideas. Since then, this actually happened. So we now have a very vibrant community. The picture that you saw before is now some of the most expensive real estate in the United States. And actually, it wasn't that nice when I moved to Boston in 2000. But that has dramatically changed. We have hundreds of startups that are there. Uh, we have a lot of jobs that are being created. But it's important to remember that this doesn't happen automatically. It happened because there was collective action, uh, primarily by the Massachusetts Life Sciences Center at the top, but also these other organizations, MassBio, which is a cluster organization for biopharmaceuticals, and MassMedic, which uh, is an older organization that's working on medical devices. So that's great, you know, and uh, cluster enthusiasts again say, okay, you know, so we not just need to create this strategy, you know, this, uh, this center, and they do something magic and we'll be there. So what did the Mass Life Sciences Center actually do? I think what you find is that there wasn't this magic silver bullet. There wasn't anything that they have done that no other region in the world has done. What they have done, however, is was to really diagnose what was missing in Massachusetts. They had the skills, but it turned out they actually did not have the lab space for startups. They didn't have mentorships for startups. They were lacking a lot of the smaller things that helped researchers to go out, create companies, and then connect with the large ones uh, that are the bridges to the market. So it's not what they individually did, the individually action, 
that the Life Sciences Initiative took that made the difference. But it was the portfolio of actions that were exactly aligned to the specific needs of this cluster. And yes, there was also government money. Uh, so there was overall about a billion US dollar that the state of Massachusetts spent over 10 years. It's a significant amount of money, but it's also not unheard of. And you know, I think there's a lot of spending that Russia does on, on these type of initiatives. But it only worked because it was embedded in a real strategy that was based on understanding on what's missing and a plan on how you could do all the small things that together make up the puzzle of changing the fundamentals that enabled this cluster to emerge. So let's go back a little bit to the, to the concepts and then, you know, both of the under, our understanding of clusters and then cluster policy and hopefully end up in some of the discussions, uh, some of which actually that are unresolved on how we should move forward. First of all, I think it's important that clusters, of course, are not a, not a new idea. Uh, sometimes people take that to mean that it's an old idea and something that we should forget, you know, there's something new around the corner. I would rather say this is an idea that has stood the test of time. We've learned new things, obviously, but the core ideas are really have proven to be important in different contexts over decades and hundred years in some ways. It started out with, uh, you know, Adam Smith in some ways, Alfred Marshall really. The core is understanding of why some locations are so much more productive in certain activities than others. Adam Smith talked about the division of labor. Alfred Marshall talked about the importance of proximity, so that if you are together with people that work on similar things, related things, not doing the same things, then you can be more productive and innovative. Jane Jacobs, the lady on top, talked then about the role of cities. Uh, Giacomo Beccatini, uh, the, on the book on the bottom, talked about the social context in which this is happening. And I think that sometimes strikes me, uh, not only in Russia, but also when I'm uh, in Asia. There's a lot of talk about the infrastructure and the money, and that's critical. But we shouldn't forget that at the end of the day, it's about people working together. It's about collaboration, using those capabilities. That's creating the innovation. It's creating the economic value. Mike Porter took these ideas and turned them into, let's say, the, the global economic context and mixed them or married them with this understanding of business strategy and how you compete successful in modern markets. There has been more developments, uh, so there's a lot of talk about economic complexity, uh, which is another sense of trying to understand the relatedness of different activities. And of course, we learn more and more about cities and their dominant role in the economy. So there is a rich body of conceptual understanding that is there. But what's really the core for clusters? It's these three things. So first of all, it is related variety. So why do I uh, point that out specifically? Because sometimes people think clusters are just about concentration of economic activity in one field, economies of scale. You know, let's, if we do a lot of it, we're going to get better. That's true, but the real dynamic of clusters is not just doing a lot of one thing. It's actually adding these other elements. Adding these element, element, uh, other elements in which people can specialize on. And we often see in the uh, empirical data that the dynamism in terms of entrepreneurship and job creation is actually not necessarily in the core of the cluster, but it happens exactly at these boundaries where you come up with new things to service this, maybe take ideas and then take these to other areas. So it's not just specialization, it's related variety. The second point is proximity. And so this is, uh, uh, you know, seems a little bit out of fashion, but geographic factors really continue to matter. We see this in cities, we see this all around the world. The knowledge and other types of flows are geographically concentrated. There is a different type of interaction that you can create within one geography. Now, that doesn't mean that opening up cluster programs for, for collaboration in other locations is a bad decision. But I think one has to recognize that these knowledge not networks that are national or global play a different role from the dynamism that you create locally uh, in your cluster. And the third point is collaboration and rivalry. So just being co-located is not enough. You get value from the interaction. Now, policymakers like to talk about collaboration. You know, that sounds more peaceful and it's great. You can help people sit together and work together. But of course, clusters like the one in Massachusetts are also characterized by very intense rivalry. 
you compete for talent, you compete for ideas, you compete for customers. And this is for policymakers everywhere a challenge, that we need to create a structure that encourages collaboration, but recognizes that true performance only will come if there's also rivalry. This is not just a joint venture or you know, a, a wider no, no joint venture of companies. It's an environment that helps individuals and companies to become more productive also in competition to each other. Now, Porter's ideas uh, you know, have been written in 1990, so it's a long time ago. What has changed? Uh, and of course, a lot of things have changed. Sometimes people think that this only means that clusters are not relevant anymore because we have globalization, we have digitalization, we have an environment where uh, proximity maybe doesn't matter that more. Now, if you look even at, at uh, the science of uh, economics of geography, the reality is a bit more complex. There are certainly factors that lead to more dispersion. You can outsource activities. You can connect with knowledge uh, hubs anywhere in the world nowadays much easier than before. You can manage global value chains. And that has led to dispersion of economic activity. But at the same time, it's also true that value creation, so not just activity, but true value creation, has become much more knowledge intensive. And knowledge and the creation of innovation out of knowledge is something that actually often happens quite bounded in a geographic area. That's where hotspots still matter. That's where cities matter. And one of the evidence is that if you look at the global map of innovation, it's still remarkably concentrated. And it's not just concentrated in a few country, countries. It's in a, concentrated in a few places. Some new places have come up through globalization on this map. But it's still a very small number of places. In fact, you know, in the U.S., one of the big concerns is that about 85% of all R&D activity and true innovation is happening in five counties. So the rest of the country is pretty flat. So yes, things have changed, but I think what that meant is not that clusters are less relevant. They continue to be very relevant, but they've changed their shape. They've become more specialized and, 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 and uh, embroiled in networks with other activities in other locations, so the global linkages are much more important than before. It's not just about mobilizing what you have locally. And the boundaries of these clusters are changing. And in that sense, I think you know, some of the comments that, uh, that you made, that clusters and cluster policies can uh, kind of hinder collaboration because they define the box of people who are allowed to collaborate. That's actually something where one needs to be very careful. Entrepreneurs always come up with new ideas, combining technologies and ideas and capabilities in new ways, and that creates values. We want to encourage that. That's not the idea of clusters to create artificial barriers. What clusters try to recognize is that we still see collaboration kind of concentrating with certain nodes. It's not that everybody collaborates with everybody else the same way. We want to see where are these densities of collaboration, and that's still something that matters. Now, uh, we talked a little bit about the cluster observatory in Russia. We did a lot of work on that, both in the U.S., uh, in, uh, in Europe, where I've, I was very active with the European Commission, but also in places like China and India. And what we see is that, you know, A, a there's clear evidence that clusters do play an important role in the economy, um, activity that really concentrates in a few places in certain sectors. It is positively associated with performance, so both productivity and innovation. I think there's very robust evidence that shows that. Um, interestingly, one of the concerns was often that clusters are not resilient. You know, it's this putting all eggs in one basket idea. But the experience of the last crisis was that actually clusters are quite flexible networks. And so if a shock hits, they have proven to be better able to find new markets and new opportunities to deploy their capabilities than individual companies that basically had to do that on their own. So even on resilience, I think, uh, uh, there's, uh, the, the, the story is more nuanced than you might think. Finally, and I think that's an important lesson for Russia, when you are changing, when your economic structure is evolving, clusters are a key element to understand what's next. Structural transformation, the change of economic specialization patterns, very seldomly happens in big jumps. It usually happens to this process of related diversification. So understanding what your clusters are today doesn't mean you have to stay there, 
but it kind of defines your opportunity space and what are the areas where you actually have a shot that are more attractive and kind of develop your capabilities moving forward. Now, when we looked at the, at the data, you know, something that we might want to discuss, uh, whether that is still true, you know, this is from analysis we did a few years back. With, what we found is that uh, uh, first comparing the U.S. to Europe, uh, in the European Union, regions tend to be somewhat less specialized than in the U.S. So the regions are kind of a, a, a smaller image of the broader economy. From a cluster perspective, if it's true that clusters drive productivity, that's not particularly good news because that means you don't specialize as much, you're probably not as productive, compared to the U.S. where the regions are much more differentiated. Uh, so this could explain part of the productivity gap that we still see between the U.S. Uh, and Europe. Now, when we then looked at Russia, um, you know, we were uh, uh, kind of confused because what we saw was regions that were even more specialized. But I think the sense was that the clusters uh, actually had more scale than scope, so that the clusters not necessarily have the right type of portfolio. They don't have the depth in terms of related and supporting industries. And so even there, you know, while specialization is good, you're starting to not benefit from the type of cluster dynamics that exist. I think that's more a point to discuss, but if that's true, that has implications for the type of cluster programs you want to uh, develop and how you want to strengthen the existing activities that you already find. So what I said so far didn't really touch so much, uh, so much about cluster policy, and especially in the U.S., there are a lot of people that say, you know, yeah, clusters exist, it's a good thing, but it happens naturally. Uh, and, you know, if government gets involved, it get, gets only uh, screwed up. So what's, what is the role that uh, government policy really has in this context? I think there are actually... Oh, so my Russian colleagues didn't see the text underneath. I hope you can still follow the, uh, the English there. But there, there are really uh, a, a number of uh, uh, situations, I think, where there is actually a case for government intervention. First of all, the context that you say, set how you compete across locations, the mobility of resources, of people, ideas, and capital, deeply affects whether or not you can specialize. That's the reason that the U.S. regions are so specialized. It's one integrated market, has been for a long time. It's very easy to relocate and choose your location. Second, performance, as I said, is not just a matter of co-location. It's also a matter of collaboration. So in Massachusetts, you know, for example, the medical device industry existed in terms of co-location. A lot of companies that did this, drawing on the, on the skill pool that existed in the region. But it changed in performance when there was also collaboration, when they organized themselves and figured out what they could do together. And finally, and I think that's kind of one of the key messages for the policy discussion, clusters can help you be more systematic and targeted in the way you upgrade your business environment in the way you make your choices on whether you should put money on infrastructure or on skills, on FDI attraction, or whatever you do. Because it, that's where you understand the specific context in which companies compete. It's not just a general discussion about we need better skilled people, but it's about what are the type of people that an aerospace company really needs right now in this location, given the economic context in which they're in. So cluster-based policies is really about the how, how can we do things, a lot of things that we already do, but how can we do them smarter? Now, one alternative way, and uh, economists like these type of graphs, so I've had to use at least one of them, um, is to really think about how does the evidence map into policy? So the evidence is sort of this dotted gray line. What we see in the data is that the more uh, there is uh, agglomeration, the more you see clusters, the more there is specialization, the higher the performance, the higher the competitiveness of this location is. So that's sort of the gray line. The question is, how do you come from the bottom left to the top right? And in principle, there are two solutions that uh, people came up with. And the one was, uh, I think, that a lot of politicians in different countries draw that, uh, okay, if clusters are such a great thing, let's create them. You know, let's create agglomeration, and then the performance will kind of automatically uh, improve. The problem is that, A, it's very risky to know where that might succeed, uh, and B, the evidence is that while density and agglomeration in itself has some benefits, unless the underlying conditions change, these benefits are quite limited. 
So a different way to think about cluster-based economic policy is really to say clusters do emerge naturally. You know, you have finance, you have uh, logistics, tourism, and so on uh, in, in, in Moscow. How can we organize ourselves and make clusters an instrument and a channel for targeting our policies to improve the business environment in which these companies operate and help them collaborate much more? The challenge a little bit is that this red line is a very fix, a quick fix. You know, you pay a large company to come, you create this big infrastructure. It's, it looks like something is happening, and that's what politicians like to see. These blue lines often work over longer time periods. And so there is a, uh, a very serious, I think, political issue. You know, how do we manage the tension between these two uh, uh, type of ways moving forward? So if you are following this approach of using clusters as a tool, as a way of organizing our thinking of, of, of economic policy, then it also means that you, know, you don't have a department for clusters in the ministry. But clusters is a way that influences all the type of things that you do. You know, how you do your workforce development, how you do your science and technology programs for innovation, how you think about infrastructure, regulation, export support, innovation attraction. So that's the way that you kind of create a more cohesive type of activity. The reality that is that also in, in, the, in the OECD countries in the West, that's a real challenge. I think we have much more examples of kind of cluster departments and individual cluster programs than we have of clusters being a mechanism to organize economic policy making for long-term growth in a successful way. But I think that's where the real potential is because then you start to integrate pieces. You start to get benefits because these policy measures become to be, to be additive. They're synergistic. They're not just kind of these individual atomistic interventions that you're trying to do. So where are we in terms of cluster programs in the OECD? First of all, I think it is, uh, you know, we've, we've moved far beyond, as I think also in Russia, beyond the stage where this was experimentation. I think it's, it's mainstream, it's not dominant by, uh, at all, but it's also significant spending. And I'm now talking about specific cluster programs, not programs that kind of has, have, have a little bit of a sectoral notion to it. Um, but there is a, a, um, quite a lot of that, especially in Europe. I think it depends often on the role of government. Uh, in Europe and in Latin America, where government is more active in economic development, we also have more cluster programs and more of these cluster initiatives. Um, is it working? Yes, to a significant degree. I would say most of the empirical assessments do suggest that companies that are involved in these programs do better in terms of employment and different types of uh, uh, um, uh, benefits. What is still very hard to show is whether, you know, if you adopt clusters as an overall approach, you systemically do better. Uh, and partly this is a measure of, a matter of, this is really hard to find the right type of evaluation measures. So it's pretty easy to have a group of companies that are in a cluster program and, a, and, a, and another group that is not, and you compare their performance and say, you know, what's, what's the delta? It's much harder to say, okay, country A has adopted a cluster approach, and a lot of other things have changed too. Did they do better or not than they would have done without these programs? But this is something that uh, certainly we're looking at and we're trying also in TCI uh, uh, to increase our, our knowledge on. Third observation is that the design principles vary a lot. Um, Partly, you know, I think it's not un unusual that there are two ministries like, like we see here uh, that, that have their programs. In some countries, they work well together. In others, not so, much, not so well. They often have a little bit different focus, whether it's regional or national. So there's a huge variety of different type of programs. I'll talk a little bit about that uh, uh, in a second. Often, collaboration among companies or companies and academic institutions is a focus. Many of those do not have the element that it's really also about business environment and changing uh, uh, the fundamentals. And the third point, I think that's quite evident for the, from the data, is that while in the early phase, I think we saw more what we sometimes call wishful thinking clusters. Uh, so, you know, clusters in areas where region really didn't have a position but thought, this is sexy, there's a growing market, let's create something out of nothing. Um, that's actually not the reality. 
of cluster programs. Most cluster programs are probably more on the other side. They're quite conservative in the sense that they work with the existing strength and make them better. The evidence is that that is um, prudent, but it, of course, also leaves us not achieving the type of structural change that we need in our regions. And so in Europe, I think there was a lot of discussion within the regional policy community how we can make sure that cluster programs don't become kind of structurally conservative, but actually become a measure of change and help regions uh, uh, evolve further. What have we learned about success of these type of cluster initiatives? Well, it's really a combination of what's the context in which you operate, what are you doing, and how are you organized? What do you bring to the table? So context is really important. Uh, if there is no trust between companies uh, and regional government, if there is no regional government that has any authority, if companies are not really open to collaboration because they are very you know, focused on cost cutting, uh, cost cutting or that type of competition, it's very difficult for the cluster organization to make any difference. So you need to understand that context and maybe work with that to at least align your ambitions and objectives. Um, I talked about activities in the Massachusetts context. So there is no silver bullet activity. It's really about the alignment of a portfolio of activities with the needs of your specific cluster that's critical, and then keeping that on for a while. And the third point that we also learned over the years is, of course, it matters how much you put in, and also who you hire. So the individual or individuals that are running cluster programs um, have to be kind of multifaceted individuals. They have to bridge government folks, companies, academia. They have to lead, but lead from behind because they really don't have the decision makers. It's a sort of managing a structure where you can't tell anyone to, what to do because they have all their own decision power. So it's a very different type of structure from the ones that we're used to. And so we're thinking much more about how we can find and educate those people. What has evolved is that there's two basic approaches to doing this. One is cluster initiatives that what I call here narrow, have a narrow model. You know, a little bit of money to meet, uh, two or three people in a secretariat, uh, creating a network, having discussions, and that's a good thing. But obviously that's also not changing the world. Uh, changing the world happens if you change what you do, uh, not just by talking a little bit more, more, more to each other. Um, so there are fewer examples of the systemic model below where the cluster organizations really become uh, the channel and organizing principle for government to move forward. There's a huge number of countries here on, on, the, on, the sca on this graph. I just wanted to show you that the ambition levels uh, and, and the role that cluster programs are differing widely across different uh, uh, countries and regions. You know, from only focusing on collaboration to channeling some money, often science fund, uh, innovation funding, uh, uh, to these groups towards really systemically making clusters an organizing principle uh, uh, of government. And I want to be clear, this is not really about better or worse. You know, yes, uh, the more you move to the, to the right, uh, you, the more impact I think you can achieve. But whether or not this is, is the right thing to do depends a lot on the context, you know, the way that your government is organized, what your ambition level is, and so on. What this all means is you have to be really thoughtful about how you organize this. The question of whether or not do, to do clusters is not very interesting. The question is how do we do this, and how do we implement these type of ideas uh, uh, in, our, uh, in our daily policy. You see the, 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 the Basque country, or Basque region in Spain, uh, to the right, and I put them up, they have a long history of using clusters because they sort of come closest to this notion that they, from the beginning, you know, after the, the Franco years, decided we want to use clusters as the way to engage with our business community. This is a, a small region, uh, a lot of industrial legacy, often SMEs, not super large companies, and so they found this an efficient way to create the dialogue between government and these companies. Uh, they benefited from a very strong regional identity, so the decision makers knew each other, so it was able, they were able to do it. So this structure has lived on over the decades. But what they did, what they focused on in terms of their activities, and even the clusters in which they were active, has changed over time. So it really moved from simple you know, engineering efficiency and productivity to innovation. It moved from working with the existing sectors that were really struggling 
uh, to building new ones, you know, like BioBasque, which didn't, they didn't have in the past, um, and making this an instrument of really changing the region. So the way that I think about clusters and their role is really that they are an important part of an economic strategy for a location, a strategy that sets out you know, performance objectives, but really defines a sort of a, a value proposition. What is it that this region is going to do in our national economy or in the global economy? Is it a research hub and what type of sectors, what are the markets that we're serving and so on? Once you've created an understanding about this role that it plays, it actually becomes easier to define what are the actions that we need so that we can live up to that vision, so that we can live up to that value proposition. Part of those actions will be cluster-specific, others will be cross-sectoral. Uh, so it's not either or, it's really the combination of the two. Cluster activities are often more impactful, but they are also more narrow in their scope. You know, they don't reach everyone. But they are really creating the traction with companies. One of the key issues, and I put this up uh, because I think it's very relevant for Russia, is how do you make sure that if something positive happens in a regional cluster somewhere, you know, let's say in Moscow, uh, in, in one of your clusters, how do we make this uh, an improvement that not just helps this cluster but becomes a, a, an change maker for at the national level. So how do we translate regional cluster benefits to change the national policy? And I think that's to some degree still a bit of an open question, but I think it's a very open, uh, important one to make clusters uh, more impactful. And to the right, uh, then, you know, um, uh, organizational structure and uh, architecture delivery structure is very important too. How you organize yourself, we talked about these cluster initiatives. I don't have time to go into too much detail on this Singaporean example, but I just want to mention this. Uh, interestingly, the Singaporeans actually don't like to talk about clusters. When you talk to the government folks, they usually say, no, no, we don't do clusters. You know, we do very good economic development. But the interesting example here of, uh, of their biomedical science initiative that has been running over the last few decades is really that this was a change driver, not just to develop one new sector or a sexy new sector, but it fit into a broader strategy of what competitive advantages Singapore had and tried to achieve and where they wanted to go as a nation. They looked at what are the local capabilities that we have, but they also looked at what are the market opportunities that exist globally. And then they deployed a set of tools that are, again, not rocket science, but the Singaporeans are very smart in doing this efficiently and kind of sticking to it and having a real plan. So I wanted to put this in because this is one of the examples that clusters are not kind of an objective of itself. You need to think about their role within your broader economic strategy. That's when they can really become change drivers and become much more effective as a tool of economic policy. Now, finally, uh, a couple of issues, you know, where, where are we? Where, what's the, the cutting or bleeding edge of the discussion? Um, and I start from the more operational to kind of the more uh, structural. So internationalization is one area where clusters have become very important tools. Um, so this is a policy area where a lot of governments try to think especially about SMEs, how they, can, how they can internationalize more. We also know that exporting is an extremely risky and costly activity. Uh, so it's not uh, easily to advise small companies to do this. Uh, but this is an area where clusters, I think, now starting to play a big role. Cross-cluster collaboration. I already talked about these shifting boundaries across industries. So we see more and more regions that deliberately do not say, you know, cluster group A works here and cluster group B works there, but they co-locate them, they have meetings between the clusters so that, you know, for example, life sciences and uh, new materials and logistics come together and see, you know, maybe something new can be created out of that. Clusters and regional strategies, a big discussion in Europe about uh, uh, regional strategy and the cluster organization's role in that. Uh, I think that's something... I need to look at. And the last one are shared value in clusters. So how can we not only create growth um, and employment? You know, the Boston Life Sciences cluster is great, but it actually employs people that anyway make quite a lot of money, you know, PhDs in biosciences and so on. How do we make sure that this can actually help a broader group of people, not just kind of the, uh, the, 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 the top of the top, if you will? 
some persistent challenges. Uh, moving from policy silos to clusters as an organizing pr principle, I think that hasn't worked so far. Even the best locations usually have a different group that does cluster rather than clusters as a permeating uh, idea. Uh, I mentioned this challenge between regional clusters and national policies. I think a lot of countries are struggling really with that, even the ones that do really good stuff. Impact assessment, as I mentioned, you know, we're good at the company level, but that's actually not the most interesting thing. The systemic change, how do we track that? Um, and then the selection process. And what I mean here is that uh, how do we make sure that we are not becoming too conservative and only work with the things that we already do well and do them a little bit better? but actually shift transition, shift towards new types of regional uh, uh, economies. Um, that's really hard, because then in the past we made the opposite mistake, this wishful thinking clusters. Um, we still need to make choices. A lot of regions end up with prioritizing everything. And we haven't really squared the circle here on the political economy. Um, Maybe you know, we need different types of economists to take a look at that, but I think that's some of the areas uh, uh, that are here. Um, so let me, let me close with this and just make uh, one, one final comment. I, I think it's easily, easy to get somewhat lost in the uh, very important practicalities and how we operate these programs. Uh, it's also easy to get a sense that, well, we've been talking about this for many years, you know, what's new and how is this really relevant now? But I think for two reasons, I think this is really absolutely central now. One issue is the increasing regional disparity that we see in so many countries. We need to find an answer to how we develop these so-called forgotten places. It's an issue in Russia, it's an issue in lots of the uh, European Union, it's an issue in the United States, it's also an issue in many emerging economies. Clusters are a tool to develop individual regions, not just the top city. You know, the great it is if Moscow does well. But here's a way that actually can mobilize regions to do better. And the other issue is even broader, and that's the uh, outlook for growth. If you look at most of the economic uh, projections and, and, and what people discuss, is what we have ahead of us, not only in Russia, is a period of low growth for quite a long time. The old ways of reaching high levels of growth, you know, debt-fueled and macroeconomic-driven, have proven to be not very sustainable. I believe it's ultimately about creating higher competitiveness, improving the environment for productivity. And again, there, clusters are not the only tool, but I think they are one of the tools and one of the mechanisms that we have to have in our quiver in order to be successful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christian. Uh, Indeed, it has been quite an interesting discussion. I think we'll have time for several questions to Christian. I'd like to yield to Evgeny Kurtsenko, mm -hmm. director of the Russian Cluster Observatory, to make a review of the outcomes of our research and plans for the forthcoming future. Over to you. Thank you, Mr. Gohberg. I am so proud and uh, happy to welcome all of you to the High School of Economics. On behalf of our team of the Russian Cluster Observatory, a warm welcome, greetings. As you may know, the international best practices have always been valuable for us. We have always kept an eye, a close eye on what has been happening worldwide. In the course of our work with Economic Development Ministry and uh, Trade and, and Industry Ministry and on the Moscow Cluster and uh, when we worked on the Medical Cluster <coughs> project, we borrowed a lot from the international uh, best practices. The international practices are not the silver bullet by no means and uh, we figured as a result of our work that Every, every now and then we know our own things worse than we know international developments and uh, still we have been able to learn more about the domestic process and developments and uh, to kickstart some of the domestic things, domestic developments and uh, 
realities. So it, it contains lots of numbers and figures. I will have to skip many of them. We have lots of clusters. 47 industrial clusters on the roster and innovative clusters and leaders, leading clusters and uh, cluster development centers. By the by, we, we figured as a result of our studies that the governmental backing helped shape private clusters. So new cluster initiatives emerge as a result of governmental backing to the public clusters. And currently around 120 clusters are in operation in this country. It is our groundwork. This is my point number one. Number two, I will echo what Mr. Goldberg has said in, in the opening <coughs> remarks and then Mr. Timur also. Over the past year, we saw new cooperation collaboration formats emerging. STI centers that were shaped earlier, technology valleys, there is a decree that has been issued and educational centers 15 of them are to be established at least but you know we have saw some regional documents when we prepared for the state council meeting There will be dozens new projects, dozens of new projects emerging. The digital technology. We'll see lots of the innovation centers shaped around it. Over the past 18 months, we have had a broad umbrella of uh, institutions shaping. We see the new opportunities, like the involvement of new ministries, digital ministry and education ministry into collaboration. We'll see more diversity of the network leaders. Economic development ministry relied heavily on regional authorities, and trade and industry ministry relied on business enterprises, industrial enterprises, including education establishment as per the governmental decree. So the education ministry focuses on academia and I and D research institutions, which is uh, in conformity with national practices. We also see the spotlight on the digital technology export promotion and the discussion on the territorial proximity, and we have discussed it right now, Vitali mentioned it, and Christian, the proximity, uh, has mentioned the proximity also. It's worth discussing, and I will have a quick word on that too. But I see some of the risks here, inherent risks. We have lots of formats, well, abroad, they use the word and the term cluster, but in our country we have come up with a broad range of terms and definitions for one the same thing and notion, but we are still to come to terms about the definitions and the and how to avoid duplication. And uh, they started from, it was the starting point in Europe, they wanted to avoid duplication, probably we should do the same. And the second risk that we have identified is when new formants are shaped without looking at, at what we have at hand, at the existing formants. So that is fraught with OLAPs and, and reputation risks may emerge. So we may change our mind quickly, 
shifting from one cooperation and collaboration model to another which will have a negative impact on our goodwill and uh, reputation. So we are to be firm and adamant in our, in our vectors, in our policies. At the end, and the final point is the unresolved management issues. So the Russian domestic experiences, by the by, are quite often ignored. People try to set up something from scratch. It is a separate topic to discuss, but our studies have laid bare the following. We compared industrial and innovative clusters. Both have some assets, but uh, these are different types of clusters and different programs, and uh, the support timeline and horizon is different and they these programs vary between one another they diverge from one another so domestically we may have a variety of support measures that is wider than what they have abroad because each of these programs absorbs lots of the previous groundwork from the relevant ministry in charge so this departmental or agency tradition adds some particular smack of flavor to a program so it's worth looking around and uh, try to figure how others do that so we should learn from ourselves from other ministries agencies and regions and we should learn from our international partners, and all of that will help upgrade programs. This, uh, this was a general point. Now, down to clusters. I'll be up front and I'll tell you that clusters, which is my key point, and TCI Network has been doing that, and Christian has told us about that, and the European Union has adopted it at as a standard one, it is a time-tested model worldwide. It's quite efficient, it's quite transparent and clear. But it does not mean it's applicable universally. Sometimes the single truths like that the wheels should be round matter a lot. You should base on them, but you know, I will not defend it any point now. What I want now is to draw your attention to some of the obvious things like the spatial and territorial concentration, the new technology and the new means and ways of uh, mobility are important but I have heard today that Moscow is a formidable stakeholder like it's different from the rest of the country, we know that, but look at OECD or, or the United States, you'll see a similar picture, not fully concurrent, but quite similar. What Christian has mentioned that in OECD, like 13% of the regions account for half of the R&D uh, value, vol volume and cost. California accounts for 20% alone, and Christian mentioned counties one level down, another level down, so this disparity and inequality is existent. And um, when the business units or businesses look for a place to settle, they look at that, at these data. You know, but you know, anyway, all the regions may have their own context and the distance of 200 kilometers you may, sp you may spend different, different time to cover the distance either one hour or four or five or more hours and that will have a toll, an impact on the uh, cluster practices. So in a, 
it lies on the surface. We may talk wide, extensive networks. So their focus always is shaped naturally. We should have a core any, anyway for each of the cluster, for each of the group. Second, my second lesson to take on board is that clusters quite seldom are set up from scratch. These are mostly brownfield things taking into account what a region specializes in. Otherwise, it's quite quite risky and expensive, you know. And uh, Christian has mentioned that, that there are two ways of cluster creation, either to operate the existing competence or build something brand new. The first approach is applied more often. And uh, with respect to the networks, well, some of the networks have few participants, 5, 10 or 20, which is better from the team perspective, but anyway, you know, quite often these small networks know each other and uh, a new name that would dub them will not give any, any tangible added value, but when you have hundreds of participants, that will give you an, an impact and effect like new links emerge and new projects come to the fore and are set up. Some some novel things emerge and unexpected things happen. Then comes the role of the SMEs. We may take major industrial platforms and sites as, as a core or an academic institution as a core, as a basis, but you know Cooperation begins when you lack something, like you lack money to get educated, or you lack funds to equip, or you lack funds to travel, or you have a weak brand, or you have a strong brand, but you lack funding or need some borrowing. This is what small and medium enterprises suffer from. Don't forget about these minor units, minor businesses. Then comes the related diversity point. Now it is a mainstream, so we should have the diversity, but it must be related. Like, let's take the, the child's cluster in Catalonia, in Spain, like food or personal hygiene or fashion and accessories, interior design, children care and recreation and uh, leisure. All of these are different work streams, but they are interrelated. And you should think how to promote all the all of these in a bundle to raise the overall competitiveness. When we put together different things in our formats, we should Obviously, obviously, try to find more synergies between the items we put in the same bundle. And uh, the question about initiators or originators, sometimes the original authorities may be the originators and the founders. Like in Samara, the original government was the originator. In other regions, the universities may take the lead, or in other regions, small and medium organizations set up a cluster, or it may be a major corporation, a big business. So originators may vary. 
quite often we neglect the importance of the organization, format and the type of incorporation. We are to invent a format that would have a level playing field for everybody. Like the collegiate groups and structures, all the participants of the collegiate body may have equal votes and these structures are important as well and the format must give all the participants an opportunity to participate and be represented otherwise there is no point in this or that form of structure and, and everybody must be equal before before the the sponsors and, and and the professional management team is important is of significance and managing networks is a standalone profession there are master master degrees master programs master courses abroad on that and I'll skip the communications slide though it is of important that the clusters bolster communication communications and another lesson to be taken on board is the financial equilibrium in this country quite often everybody looks up at the government when the government backtracks or withdraws you know the whole process falls apart like an international experience and the best practices tell us that the membership fees are a good thing and everybody must be gradually prepared for that and tuned in for that to balance your books you know you should contribute with your funds with your money to have more interest in what is going on like the higher Austria cluster center they, are, they have quite an accu accurate monitoring system but on top of the pyramid is the funding if they pay their membership dues it means that they really need that cluster and they are satisfied so the relevance is assessed with the eagerness to pay membership dues if a participant is not ready to pay a ruble a single penny which is indicative and you need to think what the value of your cluster for the business community and participants may be and cooperation formats may vary they are used to come up with the joint joint vision but you know at the end of the day it's about tangible economic projects and their implementation and the final point I want to make what the regional authorities role so they should be patient in organizing clusters like take the upper Austria example there are there's a limited number of examples with clusters living on for more than 20 years the Basque country and others you know on average it takes 10 years for a cluster to become self-sufficient at the outset of each any cluster few people are eager to pay membership dues and probably you should start with the low-hanging fruits and move upwards across that tree there are multiple examples but therefore, the regional authorities, especially once the national agenda is quite volatile, should be helpful, should extend uh, assistance and be backed by these organizational structures. So it means that uh, you have to be patient. And as uh, Christian spoke about Boston, it took 10 years or 15 years, and uh, so it doesn't happen overnight. So once you 
plant potato in the morning, don't have to get it out in the evening. A couple of words about what we are doing at the moment. Certainly we are dealing with clusters, and the Russian Cluster Observatory, this is our main focus. So we are monitoring the clusters, we are helping the colleagues, but we also look at the world in general, realizing that competitiveness depends on multiple factors pertinent to the regions. One of our products, which we are evolving, which we are developing for quite a while, this is the Innovative Development Rating. As you probably know, last year we have uh, redone it, we have revised it so with more focus on the educational um, specter. We added uh, some more pillars in terms of the quality of innovative policy, something which we collect manually, and we will continue these measurements, so which we believe are quite important, in order to understand where the regions have to move, have to aspire to. And the second our product, which I take pride in announcing, probably will make even a separate presentation of that. So this is the regional specialization atlas or map. This is what Christian spoke about, sadly. Very often this was associated with the Harvard Business School, which back in 1990s developed an approach to identify certain specializations for the Russian regions. It was uh, updated by Porter, and uh, then it was uh, supplemented by uh, some other think tanks. We have improved that methodologically. And we took the classical specializations uh, from Harvard with some adjustments pertinent to the Russian context, uh, the ones which uh, shape uh, the so-called uh, traded sector. And we saw that uh, those uh, specializations and industries which do exist in the regions really are the backbone of the competitiveness. They accumulate 44% of the employed people who, in terms of the payroll, account for 50%, but they accumulate 73% of investments, and um, they account for 82% of all the products uh, supplied and uh, sold in Russia. Betting on them, we may use that as a leverage to have an impact on the original product, the gross regional product. Certainly, we benchmark ourselves against the United States and the EU, do hope we will discuss that with Christian in the nearest future, comparing Russia and uh, the um, this composition of certain colors marking this position Russia with other countries. The picture is quite interesting. So there are two templates. The first approach is that every profile would be represented somehow. You see the industry and you see how it is distributed among the regions. And finally, for every region, we will present the specialization profiles. So, St. Petersburg actually can boast the biggest number of such profile. The size of the uh, ball uh, depends on the number of employed people. And uh, uh, there is some connectivity. We will see that uh, in some regions uh, there is more connectivity among the specializations. In others, uh, there is no connectivity. And therefore, the uh, policymakers and politicians, decision makers, actually, will bet on certain specialization. We interact with the Ministry of uh, Economic Development, which uh, developed uh, the strategy for the special development. And uh, therefore, we came up with a product called the Atlas which might be helpful for the co-authorities in order to categorize certain specializations which you find in the strategy for the special development, but making that a smarter way. Measurement of innovations in the cities. This is our big item of the agenda, along with the colleagues. We are working on that. Uh, we are studying global cities, sampling that includes major cities from all the continents. So we acquire data manually, some data related to startups, to companies, to um, the leading universities, and we develop that 
uh, this product will be more accurate rather than just statistical data. We'll identify the profile of the cities and we'll do some benchmarking. My colleague will follow it up. I would like to merge uh, the creative industry and technological development and uh, the city and institutional media. I hope that later this year we'll be able to present that product. Hopefully it would be of some interest for you. It, it will bring a lot of benefit to you. This is how the Russian cities uh, will see themselves uh, from a different perspective. Many of you were involved in the so-called uh, Winter Island Initiative. We do hope that uh, we will succeed in arranging um, a roundtable discussion about the international cooperation between the clusters within the IPIC. We would like to build interaction not only between the regions of Russia, although we see huge potential about that, but we'd like to see more cooperation being launched between the IPIC regions. And finally, interaction with the TCI network, the Global Association of Clusters. We are members of that organization for quite a while. This year, we entered the board of directors. We did believe that it was very useful for us. Uh, our mission and our ambition is about uh, highlighting the best practices uh, shared by the colleagues here in Russia. And lots of tools are implied by that association. Some of them probably will be adjusted uh, for the sake of the Russian users or end users so that this international best practices or international experience could be employed in the Russian Federation. And finally, what we are doing, another quite um, crucial thing is that along with Tatarstan, we are arranging a global conference of TSI 2020. Uh, it's been held for 23 times all over the world. We'd like to make sure that um, our Russian regions are presented well there, that they could boast uh, their specializations, their main features, and offer more cooperation opportunities for other regions of the world, which will arrive to Kazan in autumn. Thank you so much, uh, Evgeny. And... Uh, let me pass the floor to Laysan Abzalilov, Vice President from uh, Kama Innovative Territorial Production Cluster. She will speak about uh, the preparation for the International Conference TCI Global 2020. Thank you so much, Mr. Kutsenka. Thank you for your kind invitation to such a very interesting event. TCI Conference. Um, will host more than 60,000 uh, experts uh, specializing in the competitiveness and cluster policy. And uh, it will also host more than half uh, of the thousand of organizations members of TCI. The HSE is the TCI network um, member along with the Moscow Medical Cluster and uh, some other Clusters. The fact that we are part of that uh, well, very well respected organization allowed us to apply for holding an international conference. And uh, this year, in October, we are going to hold that event in the city of Kazan. Our bid was supported at the federal level by the Ministry for Economic Development, by the Ministry of Industry and Commerce, by the Association of the Innovative Regions of Russia. As I said, uh, along with the HSE, we applied for uh, the organization of that conference. Uh, strategy partners will help us. We'll be uh, supported by our uh, Tatarstan local companies. And uh, these factors taken together ensured that uh, our application was the winner because the federal support uh, certainly is crucial for deciding the location of the conference. Usually at the CCI conferences, uh, you may find organizations and specialists um, in terms of cluster development, uh, uh, people who specialize in the uh, competitiveness development uh, councils, uh, different federal ministers, lots of uh, 
representatives of academia and think tanks, more than 30% of them usually attend such conferences. We plan for a three-day-long program. The first day will include some cluster tours when the Russian Federation may enjoy the opportunity to show in practice the clusters available in the country and showcase the best practices and the best cases. Therefore, we uh, arranged for 10 cluster tours on uh, circular economy, healthcare, tourism, education, sports, IT, etc., etc. Certainly, we will present Innopolis as a new city. This is an industrial park, uh, Kimgrad, the very first uh, certified uh, industrial park, which specializes in medicine and chemistry. We'll show our center of uh, circular economy, and certainly we will present some new facilities, some new venues which were built over the last five to six years. Along with the HSE, we built a very interesting concept based on three C's. So it means that we plan to discuss three main concepts. So the cities of the future, uh, creating cooperation and uh, creating or setting up creative environment. Starting from Wednesday, we will collect uh, the applications and we'll collect the topics from all those who are eager to participate in our technical and scientific conference. So that in a couple of months to come, we may propose the agenda and itinerary. And there are some leaflets and headout materials. Um, that you may take to deep dive into the agenda. So we'll speak about smart cities. So we will highlight the best practices in terms of uh, creating such cities. Again, the concept uh, finds itself on the crossroad of uh, the eastern approach and the western approach. Because Russia is a country where the cultural traditions and economic traditions and political traditions pertinent to the East and the West are intertwined. And this is our competitive edge, and we will showcase, following our regional and federal policies, uh, how these Eastern and uh, Western patchworks may merge and fuse and to bring us some competitive edge. We'll take the best practices from uh, the West and from the East and show whatever we have in the regions. Within that block, we will show certain clusters in the megacities, the clusters that develop in some productive centers and uh, single employer cities, how the clusters may improve the living in the cities. Speak about cooperation. We will develop smart specialization topic, which is quite popular in Europe. And uh, some regional strategy of development in Russia also follow that direction. So we'll see the fruits. We'll see what is the future behind that initiative. Therefore, we'll see how the clusters develop uh, uh, the business environment. And certainly we'll look at the role of the universities uh, in uh, shaping the uh, creative economy and other things pertinent to universities and academia, which can be regarded as the main driver of the cluster-centric approach in Russia and all over the world. We believe that it is very important to, to, to uh, single out the third most important topic, how the clusters uh, shape the creative environment and how the creative environment may bring about clusters. So these things will be looked at uh, from the global perspective and from the Russian uh, perspective. It means that the conference will give you an opportunity first to show whatever the best you have for the international community and uh, we 
make it affordable and accessible for all our regions because the conference will be held here in Russia, in the city of Kazan. This is an opportunity for the regional institutions to adopt the best practices, to uh, set up contacts, to reach an agreement on uh, different new types of intelligence cooperation, and to present Russia in the best way possible. Among the speakers and experts of the conference, you may find some very prominent um, people. We have uh, already more than three dozens of uh, international Russian speakers who confirmed their participation, and more speakers will join us later. That's the st structure of the program. Actually, there are a lot of uh, cluster specialists and experts uh, living in Russia and who would arrive to Russia to see how Russia develops in that direction. You may see the specialists who would arrive to Russia to the city of Nabrzhny, Chelny. Since 2014, we are holding a conference focusing on clusters. And finally, I would like to invite all of you to uh, copy the QR code, to scan it, and to proceed to our website for further information. Um, so, the website, in very simple terms, tell you about this uh, very large-scale event. And finally, let me tell you that one of the World Bank's experts um, described to the GCI conference uh, the following way. He said that this is just the Olympic Games for the uh, athletes, um, so it um, stresses the role it plays for the cluster development. So, I invite everyone to present Russia the best way possible. So let's make this conference the best. Thank you so much. Dear colleagues, from the very outset we said that we'd like to present here the experience of two major clusters, which in our opinion can be regarded as a model for other regions. So this is the Moscow cluster and uh, the medical cluster. I would like to invite uh, Ms. Valetta to tell us about the practices uh, available in your cluster. Thank you so much. Christina started speaking about the clusters. Let me note the evolution of that project. Certainly, I would like to highlight the role of the Higher School of Economy, of Economics because your colleagues from the HSE assisted us in development of the concept. And uh, first, uh, I have to thank Christina for her presentation. And uh, when she spoke, I thought that she is speaking about a Moscow innovative cluster because this is the way we'd like to follow. The Moscow government looked at that project uh, the way that it should help us in identifying not the strengths uh, because uh, for instance we have Zeningrad, we have a city of Troisk, and there are some other specialized uh, clusters within the city but uh, it was an attempt to develop mechanisms uh, which can be used in order to facilitate the cooperation among all the clusters. You know that Moscow is different from all other cities of the world in terms of the uh, income per capita and investments, and we have more than 5,000 industrial companies, uh, 2,000 IT companies, lots of R&D institutes and think tanks, but at the same time, the internal communication between those stakeholders is not very well established. And we lack the communication between them and the government. Um, may I have the first slide, please? Thank you. <laughs> Let me proceed to the second slide. Some of the statistics, some uh, things as a pre-word. Uh, so the resources which are available in the city and the stakeholders which are present in the city. They form the clusters. 
So what cluster is it about? It's very difficult to give the definition, but generally speaking, this is a site to implement innovations and to develop cooperation among all the major stakeholders of that ecosystem where the city may play a role of a bridge, and probably this is typical of all the cities of the world. Uh, the mayor city of uh, Francisco, San Francisco, probably always say, Let's do something in the Silicon Valley, and uh, actually people will say why. But uh, in Russia, in Moscow, we can assist such projects, we can facilitate such projects. We have a say there, because budgeting is very important for the development of the innovative companies. And again, for many stakeholders, we may open up lots of opportunities in terms of... Uh, innovations being implemented in the cities. We, in terms of the goals, um, have to create unique digital innovative ecosystem. How we can we strengthen that cooperation? How can we facilitate that cooperation? We cannot communicate to everyone on a permanent basis. But we can set up an infrastructure to keep in touch with everyone. We would like to offer uh, the services 24-7 available. This is not the first stage, but rather the second stage. But proceeding to our third goal, second goal, we are here to develop the new formats of interaction between business, uh, science, and the city. One of the cases is uh, Moscow Accelerator Program, where together with the major corporations are co-funding the program of acceleration everywhere. Yandex is one of the major high-tech companies in Russia, uh, was chosen as an example. We highlighted four priority segments, uh, betting on uh, prop tech, high-tech, uh, retail, and in essence, Yandex, apart from the money earmarked, also offers uh, the infrastructure of uh, uh, its partners, such as the driverless vehicles. So we got more than 1,000 applications for the participation of that program, which is totally unprecedented. In terms of interaction between business and corporations, in terms of um, bringing them to the market. The program is in the pipeline. In two months' time, we'll have first results. I'm sure that they will be quite significant. And we will follow that way. We are looking for partners, uh, not just one company. It is not just about uh, building an internal acceleration program within one company, but we'd like to facilitate setting up a whole ecosystem where we'll act as a consortium or as a holding, bring together R&D institutes, universities, and commercial companies. Now their objective is to contribute to um, better output of innovative products, uh, more spending on the R&D and uh, increasing the number of patents. We're working through the Moscow Accelerator Program. We are using some incentives, many of which are being developed at the moment, but as far as we started working actively starting from September, suddenly some time was spent on the diagnostics of the market, as uh, Christian put uh, that we had to visit certain industrial parks, professional communities, and corporations in order to understand the weaknesses and the strength, the weaknesses which using some administrative leverage and money and others could be remedied so that we could assist the corporation. There are some specific measures which we may use back in December. We reimbursed uh, the engineering costs for some of the companies. Uh, 500 million rubles have been allocated uh, for that. Another project was approved uh, in December. And starting from March, we will start receiving 
applications for the innovative reshaping. Uh, about one billion rubles uh, will be allocated for that. So this is an innovative program which uh, celebrates uh, the uh, innovations and uh, technical investments and uh, it will be done following the cost cover approach. Other measures of support will be provided and um, we make a big funnel using the Moscow Accelerator program through which we see that within a month's time we can collect 1,000 technological projects and suddenly it becomes quite interesting for the investors, for many other stakeholders with limited access to projects, to startups, and to we have an access to mentors, to the expert community. Therefore, in essence, we offer an infrastructural solution where we bring together different uh, infrastructural professional stakeholders. Let me deep dive into the IT platform, which is called uh, the Digital Twin Cluster. So this is the first case of B2B cluster, which is not uh, a purely commercial platform. As I said, the very first stage of the platform development uh, brings about uh, the combination of services, which may meet the needs of uh, certain stakeholders of the ecosystem. Uh, rental of dwellings or rooms. This is not just what CIAN does, so we are focusing on uh, quality, not quantity. So we will let the dwellings, which may be demanded for by the small size enterprises, which need some small production sites, on the other hand, we have certain major public corporations uh, which are rooms uh, are standing idle. We are working with the Rostec, Russian technologies company, which <laughs> let uh, several hundreds of venues. We are working with the marketplace in the sense that the cluster members may bring to the leading marketplaces their products and services. It acts as a personal account available to everyone. Let me remind you, uh, remind you that once you get registered, you'll get an account and a membership. And so therefore, you can online upload the whole range of products and services you may offer. Yandex Marketplace acts as one also. We offer a certain sites for the pilot projects. Apart from aggregating the city platforms and city sites um, in healthcare industry and in the city in general, we bring together different partners. Um, uh, you may use your account in order to apply for investments, uh, in order to advertise your products and services. We have very good uh, examples or cases that, uh, for instance, certain projects uh, were included into the pilot programs and uh, these products were bought by the Russian hospitals for instance and we provide an access through our corporate partners uh, more than 100 different pilot sites which are paid for by our corporate partners also we offer the navigator in terms of the support measures one of the most popular uh, segments of the website at the moment, this is the tool which, once you specify the stage of your company's development or the stage of the company's product's life cycle, you may choose out of the support measures offered at the regional federal level uh, the ones which are more appropriate for you, more relevant for you. We also have the contract uh, production exchange. Again, we have some public corporations and a variety of uh, numerous private companies. We see that uh, most of the productive capacities are unemployed. 
and uh, for instance in the labs where in the university some of the equipment uh, runs idle. In IT Ukraine. And information on that infrastructure facilities is hard to find, but this platform is an aggregator and you can upload 3D models to have a better image of what it looks like and to make all the reckoning and calculations our service provides for that. You can see some, some of the numbers here. We have collected info on more than 30,000 companies and businesses as well as their well, the, some additional data on them are uploaded automatically from other uh, departments and agencies and the information at the end of the day on each of the enterprises is exhaustive and uh, you may find possible partners and competitors there and definitely you can present your project via your personal account you are to s set some of the parameters search parameters look for technologies or in particular areas or, or, or possible prospective partners definitely we will improve and upgrade the platform it will evolutionize in the course of time but in the parts in the in future we will be able to recommend some customized solutions to our to our clientele we will be able to present the best partners the best suppliers probably the sky is the limit for this huge array of information for the application of this array of information that we will amass. I'll stop at this and uh, probably I told you what cluster looks like in our case. I'll, I'll be glad to take your questions. Thank you Mikhail Yugai, head of Russian Moscow International Medical Cluster, a partner of ours, one of the most advanced advanced platforms of cluster type in our country. The speaker is off the mic. Yeah, mic is on now. Thank you, Mr. Gorberg. Thank you, Yevgeny. It is clear as day for me that clusters are a necessary tool, a very a very instrument, uh, an instrument that is in demand. But it is not so easy as it may seem, or you may think. I'll show you what our cluster looks from within. Just in a nutshell, a couple of words on our project. Skolkovo is still a territory that welcomes international clinics with their own protocols and uh, medical personnel and uh, their services and hardware. There is a special federal law regulating the activity of the medical cluster. We have been around for three years and uh, we started operation of our diagnostics center three years ago in partnership with the Israeli Hadassah Clinic. The second hospital will be launched, will be put on stream in 2021. This is the master plan of the first stage of the cluster. Hadassah Ophir, Ophir, a French clinic, a Korean hospital and a multifunctional medics, medical center, an apartment hotel that will host doctors and residents. Over the three years we have achieved a lot, but we are not complacent. We don't sit in our hands. We want to advance and it is a very difficult projects to implement. And uh, I think it is where we're now around uh, 60 people um, in total in terms of manpower. 
We have been attracting other clinics and medical establishments. We cooperate and are in touch with the government of Moscow, investors, including international ones. We are in touch with the federal executive authorities. And uh, the Skolko Foundation is the host of ours. They ha we, we rent a land lot from them. Our clinic specializes in marketing, attraction, legal support, design and construction technologies. So at, at the initial stage we lacked high skilled personnel because the Russian domestic labor market lacks high skilled personnel in clinic attraction sphere because you need to talk to the board of directors of a major clinic you need to speak one and the same language with them you should have a similar mindset or, or you should be able to read their mind you should and must be able to show it to them how to fit in their clinic into the Russian context and landscape So, uh, at the investor level, we have the business plan function, business plan designing. We uh, consult on business risks and uh, we provide consultancy in construction and design. We attract different types of investors of different scale. It says the government of Moscow and the government of Russia. It is about GR. It is a special ability to be able to talk to the power holders. They have a, a peculiar mindset, all of them. So, and the, we cooperate with the Skolkova Foundation also on the urban planning. Originally, we needed consultants. And uh, we initially worked with BCG. We learned from them. It is a consultancy that taught us a lot. So you need a consultant to guide you at the initial stage of your business. Then the second is the inner, cir inner circuit goals. First of all, you need the manpower, the HR. It is important to have a sound mind and to have the agility to be able to overcome the dire reality. So in the picture you can see something that is in your mind, in your head, a plan and the harsh reality. With uh, some troughs, ups and downs and precipices. If you fall, you know, you don't know whether you fall or you rise. It, seem, it may seem to you that you are falling, but you're rising instead, and vice versa. And uh, then comes the psychology. People speak different languages, I mean the different communities, the official community, the medical community and the consultants community. So our people, our personnel should have the high adaptability and flexibility of their mindsets. The third is the management model, the third goal, which should not be run by an algorithm. We have to invent it from scratch, all of it. But you know, the, there are some construction developments and other things, and uh, like in, in uh, designing legislation, you need an algorithm, and construction, you may need an algorithm. So you have, to, at the end of the day, to combine algorithms and uh, 
kind of novel approach, and you're taking you are to take into account different mindsets of financial analysts, public officials, medical personnel, and all sorts of different communities. Then come the stages of development. You may have several stages, you may have ups and downs. When you attract a hospital, a clinic, you need to attract investors. For that you need different, a new set of people, a new, a new team. Like uh, one team may be fit for a goal that lasts three to four months. So you are to have part-time personnel that you employ on the project basis. These are narrow niche professionals that you hire for a specific project. But in this case, what should we do about the corporate culture? Because you have a, a churn of, of manpower inside your company. Like if a person did his or her job well, why hire him or her? It is not simple. And the final, the final point is the motivation. Because a project may last long and uh, the immediate results may not be there. But you know, everybody wants to see small achievements, small gains. You may not have a gain for six months running and uh, people may get disillusioned. And the, the flow of energy and agility stops inside a team. So we should overcome, be able to overcome that. Now the external perimeter. I'm just uh, citing, citing our example. I, I'm telling you about our, our practices. So our statistics... So, our statistics show that it is quite hard to find a clinic that would be willing to enter your market in the, in the current international landscape. We have even fewer investors. Among all our investors, we have only one international investor, which is the French clinic. All the other participants are from, from this country, are domestic ones. And these are no medical investors, because the, the medical ones l lack funds. So you need to be quite extensive in explaining things to them. Then come the external communications. Medicine is a very sensitive domain. You need to explain it to the professional community why to build a greenfield project. Like, they, they, they may marvel at that, because... They have long worked in a facility with a leaking roof. And uh, the, final, the final difficulty is coordination with the federal executive authorities. Which is quite time consuming and, and all the procedures there, thereof are cumbersome. Each of the executive bodies has their own regulation and sometimes it takes months to, to have the coordinations done. So these are the main things. I will probably stop at this, not, not to dissuade you from the cluster initiatives in this country. Being inside these walls, within these confines, I must say that clusters are going global nowadays. So I think that a course on cluster management may, may, may be in demand, may be needed. So it, 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 it must be taught anyway. Thank you. Thank you. You have shared your unique case study. And uh, we will surely continue our partnership with the medical cluster and uh, 
We will discuss all that at the expert panel sessions. We will separately have an announcement on the launch of the training programs. And uh, we now want to move to the next level. And now I must say that Yevgeny, speaking on cluster observatory, mentioned the regional innovation index. And the latest version appeared late last year. Beside the conventional indicators that are time tested and fit into the needs of the regional policies, we have launched a new experiment on the big data analysis within the confines of the local school of economics. And it, it is about whether our regions are prepared for the future or a future. It allows, this study allows to have a different perspective on the regional development potential. I would like to invite Mr. Ilya Kuzminov, a, a director of this Strategic Analytics and Big Data Center of the ISEC HSE, to tell you a quick word on the on the methodologies and calculations. I'll tell you about how we calculated the readiness for future rating for regions. It is a decision-making support tool in clustering regional policies, one of the numerous tools that harnesses the AI and big data in order to enhance the quality, the impartiality, and the swiftness of response in decision-making on regional development in innovation and SDI. I'll tell you, first of all, about the rating, and then I'll mention the IFORA reference system. I don't have more than 10 minutes, uh, so I'll try to make it into the 10 minutes, not to delay anyone. So, while we assess the preparedness of the regions to the future, we use the semantic analysis of huge array of document, data, or text mining, as it is called, as we believe that, and it is globally believed, that the text data are one of the main tools of identifying the strategic agendas as they contain the meaning, they're meaningful. And these meanings may not, need not be decoded from numbers to words. So we extract trends in markets and competence centers and links between these, as well as the technologies and uh, the pace of their development. We are able to analyze the context in countries, regions, cities, and other locations with the help of the text mining. We relied upon two types of data, three types of data, I stand corrected. The strategic documents of uh, different regions, I mean the regulations and the federal laws, then come the data of extracted from the mass media and professional mass media and international English-speaking mass media and journals. We have um, set up a data storage including strategic documents and uh, news arrays trying to extract the digital trail of each and any region and uh, these are the parameters. There are more than 50 of alternative indicators based on the big data. In a number of cases, they fill in the blank spots in the official statistics provided by the authorities. Out of these 50, we selected six the development versus the previous period, the duration of planning horizon of regional documents, these are different strategies, 
technology-oriented regional strategies, what is the degree of technology orientation in a strategy? And whether it is rich in, in technology, and it's, whether it's relevant, and the intensity of the news and positive uh, achievements. Out of the new news flows, we extracted all the news on the, on the gains and achievements of a region and we figured out how many new works and plants were built or new technologies were delivered in a region and how what, all of that was reflected in the mass media. Then comes the thematic diversification of regional strategies. It is the term di diversity like in, in successful advanced regions, these are broader and more extensive. The, the fifth is about the proximity to the information space and image of developed countries, most developed nations like Moscow is similar to most advanced countries and uh, Moscow is very diff different from the rest of the Russian Federation, much a much richer a city. So we tried to figure out whether we have other regions that resemble developed countries, advanced countries like St. Pete and Nimal Nenets Autonomous District. And then the where, where the regional, regional agenda is in conformity with the federal strategies, which is an important trend to follow. So we made calculations on all the uh, the six of the parameters and you can see 20 regions in blue color. So these indicators overlap with the comp with the pillars of the greater rating in the top 20 regions that we singled out. We have the national champions, and uh, all of them are present in national ratings. Uh, among the leaders, we have all the same regions like Moscow, St. Petersburg, and other regions. And now, if you allow me, seizing the, the chance, I'd like to quickly tell you more about the i system. I have just a couple of minutes left, and i is... Uh, a tool to support strategic decision making. Our system was established more than five years ago. We applied it to a broad number of projects and a huge clientele of ours. Now this platform supports all the types of analytics produced by our instit institute. These are both analytics and products that are augmented with, with help of the big data, mining and analysis. I don't have time to dwell at that. It's about statistics, foresight and STI policies projection. So the big data analysis has more than 400 million documents in the database and there is an inflow of new documents to replenish the database. And we have some partners with the Russian Patent Bureau and uh, other statistics uh, authorities and agencies. We are subscribed to Microsoft Academic, which is a Microsoft system providing a mapping of the global science better than the one of Web of Science or others. So, uh, anyway we are able to come up with analytical tools and products to support the strategic decision making on agenda and problems and challenges, current situation and uh, forecasts for the future, the map of key stakeholders, technology landscape and the technology development prospects and the outcome for socioeconomic development in future and many other things. So this system provides for a wide range, range of systemic analysis and we have been applying AI 
after the technology evolution of the natural uh, language processing, we encompass different languages, including the Chinese language, and we have can extract data from the Chinese sources. They are different from our sources on China on uh, in other languages because. You know, China is a peculiar case. It, currently, it's one of the main economic partners of ours. I, unfortunately, I don't have more time, though my presentation was quite a lengthy one, and the system had lots of huge cases, including the public sector and the companies and industrial giants like Severstal and the Uniform Engine Construction Company. And we consult regional administrations, and uh, I'll stop here. And we'll show, uh, the final point of mine is that we'll launch an official website of iFora, and you will be able to learn more about that system. We are ready to provide you with presentations and booklets on demand. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. I suggest we now should. Uh, seize the opportunity of the few minutes remaining to ask question, questions or make comments on the topics of the discussions discussion made. So in any questions, any quest, anything to ask, raise your hand, introduce yourselves and uh, please turn on the mic, otherwise, otherwise we, the interpreters can't hear you. My question is as follows. The innovative cluster, what it turns out, what are the products of an innovative cluster? Whom are you asking? The penultimate uh, speaker from the Moscow Innovation Cluster. Moscow Innovation Cluster? Or, you know, uh, products may be different, may vary. It may be the, the share of innovation. In, in the service that you turn out, or probably the living standards in a city, if they're upgraded or raised, or if you look from the perspective of uh, a resident, the product is whether they have been successful in commercializing the technology and, and going live with it. So it all depends on your perspective on the angling. Mm -hmm. We're speaking about clusters. What clusters do you produce? Okay, I got your question. So this is not about the production. Then probably I have to redo my presentation. The concept is quite cumbersome. So let us look at the clusters as... Uh, look. Clusters is managed by a kind of a fund. Or the think tank. And whereas uh, Moscow is um, acting as a cluster, so our main objective is to manage the whole process, the way to boost cooperation and interaction between all the stakeholders of the innovative process, achieving certain goals. Do you understand what I mean? I do think that you will fail to do that, because in essence, uh, you want to make a startup, uh, but uh, in the framework of the planned economy. Well, we proceed from what the market tells us. If there are certain weaknesses and the market says that uh, for the sake of cooperation we need this and this, this is what we'll provide. Or for instance, if we offer a certain service platforms and they do not work, we'll substitute them with something more improved. This is not about sticking to the plan. We do not tell anyone that you should cooperate the way we offer. More questions? Yes, please. I would like to thank all the speakers. My question would be a little bit different. Can you introduce yourself, Professor Valiulian from Dubna University? Dubna is quite well known. 30 years ago, back in the Soviet Union, I was uh, behind uh, 
the project uh, Dubna uh, Technopolis or an industrial park. You know that uh, Dubna enjoys a special economic zone, free economic zone, and uh, we may see certain similarities with the clusters. When we developed the program, certainly we started the global cluster approach. I have the following question. This is not of a technical nature. There are some local currencies and clusters are also local or localized. Does it make sense to introduce some local currencies, uh, calling them a cluster currency, for instance? Does it make sense? Cluster currency, does it make sense? Well, let me explain what I mean. You know, I will respond to that this way. Cryptocurrencies may be of use because cryptocurrency may be issued by anyone. Uh, for instance, we speak about the cluster size of Moscow. When we discuss that with the colleagues, um, I do not know. I'm not sure whether it will be demanded for or not. So, uh, if you are really active with the system, when you cooperate with uh, the stakeholders, once you actually are present at different exhibitions, not always the companies are quite active, and you have to seed, not only reap. So, if you seed actively, then your status would be promoted, would be advanced in the system. So, if you are voted for by the stakeholders, that you do not violate your contractual obligations, so then again your ranking would be higher. And you will be more advanced in terms of the ranking. Then this is when you can offer some currency, where this can be used as a currency. Otherwise, let us discuss that uh, offline the conference. I just meant so that... Um, for instance, when we see some volatility in terms of the exchange rate, the local currency may act as a kind of a countrycidal buffer. Thank you. I would provide a philosophical answer. So the main currency within the cluster is about trust and confidence because there nothing can work without trust. And we'll build trust. Trust building measures are important. There was a question somewhere there. Yes, good afternoon. First uh, Deputy Director of Goop Gormash. In essence, I have two philosophical questions. The first one is of a global and institutional nature. Quite recently, Mr. Sechin, CEO of Rosneft Public, said that uh, they do not want to implement one of the major oil projects because uh, over the last couple of years uh, 50 laws were passed deteriorating the situation in oil refinery. The situation in the oil industry is now different from other industries. Our legislation usually puts a lot of uh, restrictions on the public support uh, to boost cooperation and to incentivize uh, some collective projects. And no one has mentioned that in the report, that we have to amend the legislation, that we have to amend the public procurement legislation to do the bottlenecking. Public procurement uh, is one of the pillars of the public governance. And, uh, however, Moscow cluster uh, may be good or not, it does not ensure any preferences to its uh, st stakeholders. That's a problem, and this is a problem we have to tackle. And the second problem, which is somehow related to the first one, and is quite global from the standpoint of the uh, regional development, no one... Speaking about the clusters uh, mentioned to the KPIs, what are we developing? We're developing business, the global regional product. Everyone actually presents the number of stakeholders, number of projects being funded, 
And no one says why we're doing that. So what is the ultimate goal for setting up a cluster? If all the stakeholders feel at ease there, then it is um, quite clear why they are there, why they are going to pay fees, and why the management team is there. When there are no factors uh, which I have listed, then lots of questions may be raised. Let me answer these questions very briefly. In terms of your second question, I must admit that uh, this is you are quite wrong. And uh, the KPIs, uh, oh, the clusters which are really working, they do have certain KPIs. And uh, uh, the colleague from the Ministry of Industry and Trade uh, rightly said that the managers are held liable for achieving KPIs in terms of the output, etc., etc. And in case of a failure, they have to return that money then probably you are lacking some information about the cluster projects. The projects which do not showcase real interest, they do not have any real cooperation, where stakeholders are not interested in the cooperation. Whatever KPIs you may offer, they will not work. Whereas the medical cluster, the industrial cluster, and the other clusters, they all have a consistent system of KPIs and control over achieving them. Back to your first question. We cannot debate on the quality of our institutional environment and governance, but certain steps are done in that direction, both at the federal level and at the level of uh, the constituted members of the Russian Federation, if we look at the Moscow Innovative Cluster, along with the targeting and certain support tools over the last uh, 18 months, some decisions were taken aimed at uh, lifting barriers, supporting cooperation, facilitating interaction between the stakeholders of the cluster, setting up uh, tools, raising public awareness, bring together innovative products. In case of a medical cluster, suddenly the situation was more complicated because it implies more regulation. You know, the practice of standardization and licensing in the healthcare industry and medical cluster, despite some extraterritoriality, could not avoid this pressure from the federal legislation, which is quite rigid. The situation there was quite difficult, but still, colleagues managed to tackle that. Those who know the agenda over the last two years should know that, should know the plan of action which is being implemented in terms of supporting the entrepreneurship climate. Not always uh, the progress is uh, noticeable, but it brings in more positive changes. Therefore, I won't be a pessimist. I do think that the cluster policy and cluster initiatives suddenly can be regarded as a positive factor. And to the extent these uh, cluster initiatives are implemented, it would depend the efficiency of the public policy. I have a question to Christian. Evgeny in his presentation said that in Russia we see a kind of a transformation of the cluster policy in favor of new network uh, uh, forms such as technological valleys, other networks. Do you see this trend? Uh, is it this trend uh, typical for the rest of the world? So, is there more network approaches in the world, or is it typical only for Russia? Yeah, first, uh, respond to that question, and then maybe more generally uh, comment. 
Um, so I think we need to be careful not to get confused by different types of terminologies. Uh, the collaboration within clusters, the, the, the job that cluster organizations do, has a lot to do with networking and, collabor and, and collaboration. There might be a difference if we um, basically think about networks as something that's not geographically defined. Uh, I don't see those as, as alternatives. I think we need both. Uh, I think that's the way that the global economy works. We need the local buzz and we need the global linkages. Um, I do see that cluster programs are much more focused on also creating these international linkages uh, and where barriers, legal barriers existed to cluster uh, organization membership that's ge ge geographically bounded, they have often been taken away. And the logic was that, well, if a company or an institution that is some located somewhere else but is so interested in what's going on here wants to participate, by all means, uh, you know, uh, their geographic location will have an impact. So, so I think we need to, uh, to maybe review that discussion. I think the core of the idea, the role of geography, the role of related diversification and specialization um, is, is underlying all of these type of activities. But let me make uh, two, 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 two broader uh, comments on the, on the discussion and the other presentations. First, I mean, it is impressive how much is going on. Uh, it's also impressive what type of research is being done and what type of data uh, is available. Um, at the same time, I also feel, you know, uh, we need to be careful not to start running before we kind of have a clear understanding of, uh, of, of what we all mean. So also some of the questions reflect that we, we do need to have fora where we really discuss on what do we mean by cluster organizations? What do they do? What are their objectives? What, what is the task, the job that they are doing? What is the, the hole in the system that they are filling? Um, I think if you don't have this anchoring and kind of a broader understanding it's, it's, it's very hard to, to avoid jumping very quickly from, okay, we try a little bit of that, and then we try a little bit of the other because things have not worked out. And, you know, your graphic showed very well that reality is never a straight line. You know, there are ups and downs and, and learning. So, so I think there's a role for places like, like the higher school to say, you know, it's not just about the data, it's about the understanding. You know, what's the framework? What's the job that these institutions uh, are doing? Um, I saw in a lot of projects that I've done in different countries, uh, as, a, as a researcher, I went into the analytics and the data, but the whole process often was more important in the sense of creating a common language and understanding what we were really doing. The facts mattered, but not as much as I thought they should matter as a researcher. It was more about creating this common understanding, and there, there is something that my sense is, maybe, maybe there's a need to, to deepen that here. The second point is that... Uh, I talked a lot about international experiences. Uh, uh, Evgeny talked about some of the learnings and how uh, complicated it is that sometimes to translate them into Russia. You need a model that works here because this is a way of collaboration and a structure that has to solve your local problems in a local context. So uh, unfortunately, that means there is no ready-made recipes that you can just apply but you are very smart people in Russia, so I'm, I'm sure you will do that. But that requires a consistent learning process. You know, what are we testing? What is the evidence on impact? How do we, do that? How do we then systematically improve these type of approaches? The more that happens, I think the more we'll see kind of an own Russian type of cluster-based economic development that is not just, you know, copying what seems to be working in the U.S. or Korea or some other place, but actually helps you uh, making, making a process. So... I look forward to then uh, going to Kazan and, and hearing much more about the experience of different Russian regions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. Uh, I think it's, it's a very good wrap-up to our discussion. Uh, Dear colleagues, let me call it a day. I just think that the discussion was quite interesting as usual. We are running out of time. We are short of time to continue our discussion, but we will certainly uh, arrange another uh, discussion in April within the conference, which is planned for the first week of April, the press conference of the High School of Economics. This is one of the biggest such academic events in Russia. We'll focus on the discussion about uh, regional policy and cluster policy. You're invited as far as 
you're all included into our database so keep posted keep me posted and stay tuned we'll be glad to see you and uh, we'll appreciate if you send to our Moscow cluster observatory certain propositions certain presentations whatever we can improve any of your ideas how to arrange for the expert discussions for instance we have agreed with the Ministry of Industry to hold a special discussion on the experience of implementing the experience of international industrial clusters and public support so altogether we will discuss the Moscow cluster experience uh, with our colleagues from Novosibirsk we will discuss the idea of uh, a major project called Academic City 2.0 uh, the idea which has been proposed for the consideration of the federal government. So it means that we have a very busy schedule for the years to come. Once again, thank you so much. And I'd like to extend my special thanks to Christian for his participation, for his input, for a very interesting presentation. I'm sure that uh, Christian will be our regular uh, guest in the High School of Economics. We have agreed about uh, some lectures, some joint uh, research so once again thank you so much i wish you very good new year every success in this new academic year thank you <laughs>